We now enter a new century and a new millennium of NFL football, kicking off with the 2001 season. And we say kick off appropriately, given the picture we have here of kicker Adam Vinatieri, who this season made perhaps the most difficult kick in NFL history, forever altering the course of NFL history in the process. This is also the final season where the league fielded 31 teams, as the Houston Texans will be joining the fold next season to give us the 32-team NFL that we know today. In 2001, the improbable happened, as the New England Patriots not only reached the Super Bowl, but defeated the dynasty-in-waiting St. Louis Rams. And they did so, naturally, on a field goal from Adam Vinatieri as the fourth quarter clock hit triple zeros. The Patriots' path through the playoffs only adds to this improbability, and despite winning the Super Bowl, they are nowhere to be seen in the top five rankings. This happened once before in 1968 with the New York Jets, and again in 1970 with the Baltimore Colts, where the Super Bowl champion that season didn't make the top five. It's been 31 seasons since. In fact, over the past 13 seasons, the champ has been number one 10 times, and number two the other three times. So yeah, improbable is the right term. The Rams do top the list with the Bears and 49ers making surprise returns to join the Eagles and the Steelers. The Panthers finally fall out from their hot start all the way to the bottom spot, with the Vikings, Cowboys, and Bills falling from Grays into the zone as well. It's time to get it on. Imperialism begins now. Our first spin of the wheel is going to get us right on the field. It's going to land on the Redskins. They're going to head to the northeast to hit the territory of the Baltimore Ravens. Now, we've seen in previous imperialisms, the Ravens don't exist in this game. So we've got to dress them up in another team's uniform. And with no teams eliminated, that's going to make it tricky for us to start with. We went ahead and chose the Cowboys, no particular reason. It's definitely going to look weird, especially with star logos all over the place. But it will be the Redskins at the Ravens. We're under the two-minute warning in a scoreless game. The Redskins have driven it down to the Raven 25. Former Raven Tony Banks throws it up, and Rod Gardner will go up and come down with it to break the gridlock, giving Washington a 7-0 lead. It is now 10-3 in the fourth quarter. The Ravens are all the way backed up at their own four-yard line. This delayed handoff to Jason Brookins. He can't get out of the end zone. It's a safety for Washington, and that's going to do it for this one. The Redskins head to Baltimore and win 12-3. The Ravens definitely aren't the same team they were in 2000 when they won the Super Bowl, but they were a playoff team in 01, so this loss is a bit surprising. The Redskins will take over their territory, and they now own Maryland as if the Ravens were never in the game. The bottom-ranked Panthers are going to try to invade the area of the Tennessee Titans. That's going to be our next game. The Panthers are hanging in there, only down six in the fourth quarter in Titans territory. Chris Wenke is going to look for Donald Hayes. Samari Roll is able to get there and make that interception, ending the Panthers' threat. As a matter of fact, the Titans take it all the way down the other direction. This pitch will go to Eddie George with under a minute to go. Gets into the end zone to give us our final score of Titans 30, Panthers 17. The Panthers showed a lot of heart, but they couldn't get the win here. The Titans will take over their territory, and they will be touching the eastern coast of the United States now. We're now ready to head out west. This wheel lands on the Arizona Cardinals. They're going to dip into Southern California and face off with the San Diego Chargers. Scoreless in the second quarter, but the Cardinals are on the move. First and goal from the five yard line. This pass is gonna go up to David Boston. He's just bigger than everybody else. He makes that catch to give the Cardinals a seven to nothing lead. Later in the quarter, it's now 10 nothing. The Chargers are looking to break through. They've reached the Cardinal 
24-yard line. This goes to rookie running back LaDainian Tomlinson. Slithers his way through the defense and scores the first imperialism touchdown of his career. We imagine we will be seeing many more over the years. The Chargers open it up now in the third quarter. This touchdown pass to Freddie Jones, and then this touchdown pass to Curtis Conway will give them a 20-10 to 10 lead. They missed an extra point somewhere in all that bonanza. The Cardinals now have to come from behind after leading, and they've taken the ball to the Charger 15 on third and 10. This short pass goes to Steve Bush, doesn't get the first. The Cardinals could kick here, but they're going for it. The run up the middle goes to Michael Pittman. He has the first down, and he was able to get it into the end zone. So the Cardinals get aggressive here and put seven on the board, and they trail 20 to 17. The Chargers will try to salt the game away here. Third and four, handoff up the middle to Tomlinson. The Cardinals are all over it, so they get it back. They've taken it to the Chargers 17. It's third down. Plummer will drop back to pass, look for Thomas Jones. Incomplete out of bounds. Surely now they'll kick the field goal. They do not. This is an aggressive team, it would seem. They're going for it. Will that aggression pay off? Fourth and eight, down three. Jake Plummer looks toward the end zone. It's David Boston. Touchdown, Cardinals. And they've now retaken the lead at 24 to 20. The Chargers get a good kickoff return and set up shop in Cardinal territory. From the 45-yard line, play action to Tomlinson works. That releases Curtis Conway. Flutie slightly overthrows him. He still makes the catch. They're down at the 9-yard line. First and goal, 48 seconds to go. Flutie will drop back, find Freddie Jones, and he's just short of the end zone. Second and inches on the goal line, into shotgun. They're going to throw the ball. Flutie will throw it out of bounds, facing the pressure. Third down, man in motion. Surely they'll run this ball now. They don't. He's going to look for Curtis Conway. The defense knocks it away. This is it. Fourth down. They can't kick. They're down four. They're finally going to hand it to Tomlinson. And he will get into the end zone to put this game away. We thought he'd be getting more touchdowns in his career. Didn't quite know he'd get one in this game. It's the game winner. And the game that's off kind of iffy turned into a classic. The Chargers come from behind twice to win this game 27-24. Sometimes two teams with a losing record can put together a game that knocks your socks off. These guys just did that. The Chargers will take over the Cardinals' territory, and they've kind of escaped the darkness of the late 90s. They're going to be emerging as a pretty solid team over the next 10 years or so. After a couple of rounds of expansion, we now have the Detroit Lions heading to Green Bay to face the Packers. Late in the first half, the Packers face third and goal from the 30-yard line. They're just going to run him on Green, but he has some ideas about what to do with this. He's going to run it in for the touchdown. That looked like just a play to get it over with to kick the field goal, but the Packers will instead extend their lead to 17-0. That completely deflated the Lions going forward. They couldn't get on the board. The Packers will wind up winning this game 40 to nothing. The Packers had little trouble with their division rival in this one. They will take over the state of Michigan, knocking the Lions out of the game. This is going to be a very close call. It's just going to get past the Niners into the Bills. They will head down south, and after expanding into Vermont, that puts them on a pathway to face the Giants. Up by 10 in the third quarter, the Giants face first and goal. Kerry Collins scans the field. He's going to find Ron Dane. Never caught a touchdown pass in his NFL career, but he gets one here. The Giants extend out to a 24-7 lead. They have a little problem putting the Bills away in this one. 38-14 final. We mentioned that the Bills had fallen on hard times. This is about as hard as it gets for them, getting blown out by the Giants here. New York will take over New York and expand their land. 
We're going to be getting an interesting matchup here. The wheel lands on the Colts. They will head into the territory of the Bears. The Colts really disappointed this season having a losing record, while the Bears, in the eyes of many, fluked their way to a 13-3 record. They are a top five team in our rankings. This should be an interesting matchup in Chicago. The Colts come out sizzling, taking the ball down to the Bear 12-yard line. Peyton Manning holds in the pocket, looks for Terrence Wilkins, will get the touchdown. The Colts strike first, taking a 7 to nothing first quarter lead. But the Bears have methodically moved the ball down the other way and have gotten it inside the five-yard line of the Colts. Some movement here. Jim Miller will call an audible. He is facing some pressure, but he gets it off to Marty Booker, who somehow takes that ball away from the Colts defenders, tying this game up at seven points apiece. Still in the first quarter, the Colts are facing third and eight in their own territory. They're going to try Dominique Rhodes up the middle. Breaks a couple of tackles. Can't get the first, but will fumble as well. RW McQuarters will force that. The Bears turn that into a field goal. Now in the second quarter, the Colts inside the 10. Manning will look for Terrence Wilkins, his second touchdown of the game. The Colts withstand that fumble and get out to a 14-10 lead. Now we head to the third quarter. The Bears have moved the ball down to the Colt 21-yard line. Lots of changes on the line again. This handoff up the middle will go to James Allen. He will spin away from a couple of defenders, gets into the end zone, restoring the Bear lead to 17-14. The Colts have essentially given up running the ball in this game. They're throwing it almost every down. They've gotten it to the Bear 29-yard line. Peyton Manning lifts it up to Marvin Harrison. What a great throw past the defender. Harrison catches it in stride and will now give the Colts a 21-17 lead. Chicago will face third and seven in their own territory. Now in the fourth quarter, Jim Miller is going to get dropped by Marcus Washington. That's going to give the Colts a chance to come through here and put this game away. It's third and seven, not quite in field goal range. Peyton Manning shoots it down the middle, but it's intercepted again. A big play by R.W. McQuarters. That'll give the Bears life. They've now moved it to just inside Colt territory. Play action pass. Jim Miller will place this ball perfectly into David Terrell's bread basket. First down, Bears. They've now moved it to the three-yard line. First and goal. James Allen up the middle again. Will score the touchdown with 139 remaining. The Bears lead. Can their defense hold on? Set up for an exciting finish here. The Colts from their own 40-yard line. Peyton Manning is going to stay in the pocket till the last second he gets rid of this ball, and Ken Dilger will make the catch and pick up about 15 yards after. They're down to the 10-yard line. It's first and goal. Under a minute remaining. Manning will once again look for Dilger. This one's knocked away. Sack on second down. Here it's third and 18. Manning will drop back, throw it to Marvin Harrison, and in almost a replay of their earlier touchdown, the Colts get into the end zone, under 30 seconds to go. They're going to come away with a thrilling victory in Chicago, a bit of an upset here, 28-24. Peyton Manning's stat line in this game was pretty hilarious, 444 passing yards, four touchdowns, all about them fours. The Colts show they have the talent despite their season performance. They will take over the Bears' territory. We've never seen a team with a losing record win imperialism. If any team can, this would be it. We head back to the wheel. It's going to be landing on the New York Giants. The arrow will take them slightly southwest, easily hitting the territory of the Philadelphia Eagles. Phillies in complete control of this one, leading 17-0 in the fourth quarter. McNabb has all day in the pocket, will find Todd Pinkston for the touchdown, extending the Eagle lead to 24 to nothing. They really emerged this season in 2001. They will tack on another one to come out with a 31 to nothing shutout victory. 
not too long ago, the Eagles were in our bottom five. Now they're in our top five. Head coach Andy Reid has turned this team into a unit. They will take over the territory of the New York Giants, and they are a presence now in the Northeast. The Eagles are getting right back on the field. They'll be invading the Washington Redskins. In the third quarter, the Eagles lead 3-0, but Washington's on the doorstep, and Donnell Bennett will get over the doorstep, giving the Redskins a 7-3 lead. The Eagles' offense has been flat the whole game. Washington gets the ball back. We're now in the fourth quarter. From the Philly 38, this pitch goes to Steven Davis, and he's going to leave several tacklers, would-be tacklers, in his wake. He gets it down to the 14-yard line. From there, Tony Banks finds Michael Westbrook. He will score, and Washington now leads 14-3. The Eagles are going to need a jolt here, and they've driven it down to just around midfield. It's 4th and 2, 222 left. They'll pitch it to Corell Buckhalter. He will get the first down with 2.09 left, but the Eagles slowly move the ball down with 33 seconds left. Time ticking away. The Eagles are again going to go to Buck Calder, this time through the air. So the Eagles finally score, cutting it down to 14.10, but there's only 21 seconds remaining. They're going to have some time. They're going to line up for this onside kick. They're going to have to recover it. The ball is laid down. The Redskins can't get it. So Philly's still in this. They're going to set up shop at midfield. Still 21 seconds to go. McNabb is going to dump this off to Deuce Staley. He is going to pick up a decent chunk of yards. So there's going to be time for one last play. Might the Eagles actually try to throw this ball downfield? Play action. He will throw it somewhat downfield, well short of the end zone. Incomplete anyway. The Redskins hold the homeland. Win this game 14-10. Maybe we spoke too soon on the Eagles here. They were number two in the overall rankings, but they are now out. The Redskins take over their territory, and we have two top five teams, the Eagles and the Bears, who have been eliminated. The Cowboys got in an expansion, and now they will welcome the Denver Broncos. Dallas has cut a 16-0 lead down to 16-14. Denver looking to reestablish themselves. This deep pass is going to go to Kevin Casper. He's going to run it down to just about the one-yard line. That ends the third quarter. To start the fourth quarter, Mike Anderson will take it in for the touchdown. The Broncos extend their lead out to 23-14. It got close, but the Broncos held the lead the entire game. They will come away with the 30-20 final score win. These are tough times for the Cowboys, considering all the success they've enjoyed over the past 30-plus years. They will lose their territory to the Broncos, and the Broncos look like they might have the largest piece of land right now. The Browns have continued improving since re-entering the league. They're going to put that to the test in Indianapolis. It's a one-point game in the fourth quarter. The Colts lead. This reverse goes to Terrence Wilkins, and he continues his excellent imperialism by getting in for the touchdown. The Colts extend their lead now to 21-13, but the Browns do not wish to go away. They have taken the ball down to the Colt 14. It's fourth and nine. Tim Couch is going to throw this to Kevin Johnson. He will get the touchdown. They could have gone for the field goal there, but we're seeing a lot of aggression here lately in Imperialism. It's 21-20. The Browns are going to line up for this onside kick. The ball is free, but the Colts will land on it. They'll turn that into a touchdown and come away 
with the 28-20 victory. The Browns have yet to taste imperialism victory since coming back into the league, but they are getting much better. 2002 is going to see them make the playoffs. But this is 2001. The Colts win this game, taking over the Browns' territory and adding Northern Ohio to what they already have. We've now eliminated 10 teams. Next up on the wheel are the Broncos. They're going to head out west, and they're going to be facing off with their division rival Chargers in San Diego. Denver has it within three. It's third and ten from just outside the ten. Marcellus Wiley will force a bad pass here. That'll make it fourth down. Jason Elam, a great kicker, coming out for a 28-yard game-tying field goal, except that he missed it. That's hard to believe. The Chargers take advantage. A great block in the backfield by Tomlinson. Opens it up for Curtis Conway, running under that Doug Flutie pass for the touchdown. The Chargers and the Broncos were locked in a tight game. That makes it 17-7, and that is going to be the final score. The Chargers are starting to emerge. This is a potentially good decade for them in imperialism. They will take over the Broncos' territory, and if there was any question about the largest piece of land before, there's none now. It belongs to San Diego. Who will the wheel give us next? It's going to be the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They're going to head to the southeast and in a rare sight for the Dolphins. They're going to get to host the game against Tampa. Tied at 7 in the third, the Bucks have run it all the way down to the 4-yard line. They'll now drop back to pass, but Brad Johnson, ever so nimble, is able to run it in from 4 yards out for the touchdown. The Bucks lead 14-7. They'll tack on another touchdown in the fourth before conceding a field goal, bringing us to our final score of 21-10. Usually it's the Dolphins who have to take to the road. This time they got a game at home, but they couldn't take advantage. The Buccaneers will take over their territory, and they are the Kings of South Florida. After some expansion, the Minnesota Vikings will be taking the field in Kansas City against the Chiefs. We had a touchdown bonanza in the first quarter. Priest Holmes will catch this touchdown. He will then run in this touchdown after breaking a couple of tackles. The Vikings will respond with this pass to Jim Kleinsauster. So at the end of the first quarter, it's 14-7. The offense slowed down. Late in the third, Minnesota's added two field goals. They trail 14 to 13. Just inside the 50, this deep pass goes to Randy Moss. That's actually his first catch of the game. Gets it all the way down to the one yard line. 46 yard gain. Dante Culpepper will run it in himself. He gets stuck, but he gets in eventually. And as the quarter expires, the Vikings have now taken a 20 to 14 lead. The Chiefs have an explosive offense. We just haven't seen it. It's now 3rd and 13 from their own 35-yard line. Trent Green steps up, runs up, looks for Priest Holmes, makes the catch, picks up a bunch of yards. Holmes had a great game, over 75 rushing and receiving yards. Now from the 3, the Vikings will back up the defense, anticipating pass. The Chiefs do pass. It goes to Snoop Minnis, who'll make the catch in the end zone. The Chiefs have finally scored, haven't done so since the first quarter. With the extra point, they lead 21-20. The Vikings are on the march. After back-to-back -back incompletions, it's 3rd and 10. Culpepper will take it himself, and he does so very well, cutting inside, bouncing around to the outside. An incredible run here by Culpepper. That's going to be 35 yards for the first down. It's now 3rd and 18. A minute one to go. They're going to take the short safe pass to Byron Chamberlain to set up a better field goal attempt. This will be from 44 yards. It's Gary Anderson. Two for two in this game. Famous and infamous all at once with Viking fans. The kick is up. It is good. And the Vikings will go into Kansas City and escape with a 23-21 final score victory. And what a monumental victory that was for the Vikings. Not just because they made a 14-point comeback, 
but because that is their 60th imperialism victory. They are the first franchise to accomplish that feat, and they did it in a season where they're in the bottom five. All that matters, though, is they've taken over the Kansas City Chiefs territory, and they're still alive looking for victory number 61. The Redskins have already eliminated the Eagles. Can they do the same to the Steelers? The Steelers lead 7-0 in the second quarter. This is a play action up the middle. Cordell Stewart will throw it up. Plaxico Burris will come down with it, spin away, and score the touchdown. The Steelers add on to their lead. It's 14-0. They'll concede a field goal before the end of the half, but have no problem the rest of the way. They go into Washington and beat the Redskins 28-10. Even though they got to host both games, it was always going to be a tough ask for the Redskins to knock out both the number two and the number three ranked team. The Steelers will take over Washington's territory and they'll be looking to make amends for how their 2001 season went wrong. The wheel is going to be picking out the Atlanta Falcons. Yes, that's where it lands and they're going to head up to the northeast. That's going to hit the territory of the Tennessee Titans. That game is next. The Falcons are in total control, leading 14-3 late in the first half. Chris Chandler drops back the pass. Terrence Mathis escapes the defense, makes the catch in the back of the end zone, extending the Falcon lead to 21-3. They kept the Titans out of the end zone until the fourth quarter when it was much too late. The Falcons win this game by a score that's deceptively close, 31-20. This was our first time seeing the Falcons on the field this season and they took care of business without much problem. They will take over the territory of the Tennessee Titans and they've started growing now where they're about to hit the Midwest. We've now played half of our games. 15 teams are out and we're getting the Rams. They're heading west to face the Vikings. Our number one ranked team is taking the field for the first time. St. Louis leads 28-14 in the fourth quarter. The Vikings will bring their defense up. The Rams will change their play, and in doing so, Torrey Holt's going to escape by himself. Kurt Warner finds him, of course. Touchdown, Rams. That will make it 35-14. That was the beginning of a 33-point fourth quarter combined for both teams. Vikings had this tied at the end of one, but the Rams were too explosive. They win this game 49-26. The Vikings got their big win earlier, number 60, but they weren't beating the Rams in this one. The Rams will take over their territory and their march to a potential imperialism championship has begun. With this spin of the wheel, the Packers are coming back to the field. They're not going to mess around. They're heading to the territory of the Rams. So we talked about their march. It continues now. We're tied at 14 in the third quarter. From the Ram 36, play action. Brett Favre is going to fire this to Antonio Freeman. The Rams can't bring him down. He does finally go down here at the one yard line. They got knocked back to the eight though. They're certainly gonna wanna cash this in for seven. Antonio Freeman takes the delayed route and Favre's gonna find him. So after all that, Freeman will get his score. That's gonna make this 21 to 14. The Packers get the ball back really quickly and move it down to the Ram 31 yard line. Brett Favre drops back, fires for Freeman, and this time Freeman's going to get the score on his first try. The Packers have extended out to a 14-point lead, but the Rams' offense is way too good to be counted out of this one. They've taken it down to the Packer 36-yard line. Kurt Warner looks for Isaac Bruce. He finds him, and Bruce will score. There's still 3-11 left on the clock. This is going to be a 28-21 game. The Rams will not onside kick this. They kick it away. They're going to trust their defense. Here on third and five in the shotgun, Favre's going to look for Bill Schrader. It's not a great throw. Lucky it wasn't intercepted. The Rams get it back. They're on their own side of the field. 2.06 left to go in the game. Kurt Warner, he is holding, holding. Fires for Isaac Bruce, and he will make the catch. He ran a short pattern, but got out, and he's going to run it down inside the one yard line. 
on the next play. They got Ricky Prohl in the backfield. They'll give him the ball and he will score. So with a minute 28 left, the Rams have made up the entire deficit. We're tied up at 28. Here come the pack, though. They get a good kick return. They're setting up at their own 39-yard line. This is a reverse to Antonio Freeman. He does it all. He is able to cross midfield, putting the Packers in a pretty good spot. They have fallen back to third and 19, though. Favre, he's going to look for Bill Schrader. The pass is in the air, and Schrader makes a diving catch. That'll put him in field goal range. There's still 33 seconds left to go. They're going to run a reverse to Schrader, trying to kill some clock, maybe pick up some yards. Schrader does well to get it to the 14, and that's all they need. They're going to bring Ryan Longwell out for a potential game-winning field goal. From 32 yards out, the St. Louis crowd making all kinds of noise. The kick is up. It is good. And the Packers stroll into St. Louis. Fend off the Ram comeback and win 31 to 28. This is now the third consecutive season that the Rams have taken a home loss to eliminate themselves in imperialism. A major disappointment for what was by far the best stretch of teams the Rams ever had. That said, the Packers will take over their territory. This was a playoff team in 2001. In fact, they got rampaged by the Rams in the playoffs. So they've gotten their revenge for that and they're moving on in imperialism. After all that excitement, we're going to be ready for our next game. It's going to be with the Atlanta Falcons heading down to face the Jacksonville Jaguars. The Jags are starting to pull away. Up 24-14 in the fourth quarter. Mark Burnell, screen pass goes to Stacy Mack. He's got all the space he needs to run into the end zone. The Jaguars now lead 31-14. They turn the Falcons over real quick, get themselves another one, using a big fourth quarter to win this game, 38-14. The Falcons showed out earlier against the Titans, but they couldn't keep that up against the Jaguars. Jacksonville will take over Atlanta's territory, and they've got the panhandle of Florida stretching around to the end of North Carolina with South Carolina just sitting there in the middle. We're getting right back to it, and so apparently are the Jaguars. They're chosen on the wheel. They're going to head to the southwest into the territory of the New Orleans Saints. The Saints are really pouring it on in this one. They lead 24-14 in the second. This handoff goes to Ricky Williams, drags his way into the end zone. The third of four touchdowns that Ricky scores in this game. 31-14 at the half, and this high-scoring game is going to end with New Orleans winning 48-28. Just like the Rams before them, the Jaguars won a game but then couldn't get back on the field to win a second one. The Saints will take over their territory, and except for the Buccaneers sitting there in South Florida, they are kings of the South. A somewhat close call coming up on the wheel here. It won't hit the Jets. It'll stay with the 49ers. They're going to head straight north. That's going to catch the territory of the Seattle Seahawks. The Niners will look to pull away here from the six-yard line. The pressure's coming on Jeff Garcia. He gets it off. Kevin Barlow makes the catch, dies into the end zone. That will give the 49ers a 21-7 lead. And from this point, they do successfully pull away, taking care of business. 35-7 final score. Over the years in imperialism, the 49ers have tended to have the Seahawks number. That's not changing this season. They will take Seattle's territory over, and the 49ers control the Northwest. Our next wheel spin is just going to miss hitting the Jets again, but it will hit the Raiders for the first time. That arrow will dip just southward enough to hit the Charger territory instead of the 49er territory. An AFC West battle is coming up next. We're late in the game and the Chargers have finally scored. They're going to try to onside kick down 17-7, but Tim Brown's going to recover it, and he looks like he might return this all the way for a touchdown. Gets taken down at the 11. That'll lead to this touchdown run by Charlie Garner. The Raiders handle the Chargers offense in this one, winning 24-7. That was certainly a successful first foray into this imperialism 
for the Raiders. Not only do they win and take over the Chargers land, but they went from their original territory to now having the largest land in the nation. We're down to our final 10 teams and once again this wheel will not land on the Jets. The Raiders are chosen again and this time they're definitely hitting the territory of the 49ers. The two final teams in the West are going to get it on. The Niners lead by three in the third quarter, looking to add more, but it's third and 15. That's not going to matter to this combination. Jeff Garcia finds Terrell Owens, who streaks into the end zone, giving the Niners a 24-14 lead. The Raiders have pulled out some miracles on the Niners before, and as the third quarter expires inside the 20-yard line, Charlie Garner, former 49er, will get into the end zone. So again, as the third quarter has now ended, it is 24-21. The Niners are probably going to want to score again to give themselves some security. They've taken it down to the four-yard line. Jeff Garcia is going to roll out, find Garrison Hurst as his outlet for the touchdown. That reestablishes a 10-point lead, 31-21 and there will be no Oakland miracle in this one. That's going to hold as the final score, 49ers win. And a big win it was for the 49ers as they take over the Raiders' territory, and there's an argument to be made that the Niners have about as much land as every other claimed land combined. We keep up the pace with another game on tap. This wheel lands on the Colts. They're going to travel to the Northwest. This is going to be a fun matchup. They're going to Green Bay to face the Packers. Indy's been moving the ball. They've got it to the Packer 24, but it's third and 14. Peyton Manning squeezes this pass into Dominique Rhodes, but he loses control of it. Green Bay will pick up the fumble, and they have now moved it up to the 33-yard line. They're facing second down. Brett Favre is going to look deep for Antonio Freeman, and he continues to dazzle this season. Takes it down to the 14-15 yard line. On the very next play, first down, once again play action. This time, Favre looks for Bill Schrader, and the Packers are on the board as the first quarter nears its end. 7-0 Green Bay. We now move ahead to the second quarter. The Colts have taken the ball just past midfield. Important third down here. Peyton Manning is going to find Marcus Pollard, make some impressive moves to pick up a bunch of yards after the catch. They're at the 20-yard line. They've actually picked up nine yards. Second and one, Dominique Rhodes goes up the middle, breaks a tackle and scores, making up for that lost fumble. We're tied up at seven apiece. This game is going to move along now to just inside the two-minute warning. The Packers on 4th and 10 will be forced to punt. Amon Green will take the direct snap, stay in bounds, and pick up the first down for the Packers. That's going to lead to this field goal attempt on 4th down. At least we think. Yes, Longwell is going to put it up. It almost gets blocked, but he gets it off from 34 yards. It's good. The Packers lead 10-7 at the half. The Colts race down the field to the 9-yard line. Peyton Manning drops back the pass, holds it too long and gets sacked. But worse than that, he has been knocked out of this game. That is crucial to the Colts' chances. Mark Rippon is going to have to come off the bench and take his place. He's going to be throwing the ball, but it's not a great throw. Bawe Ju of the Packers makes the interception and takes it out to about the 35-yard line. The Colts' defense, though, will step up and get this ball back, and they've moved it well with Rippon down to the 19-yard line. He is about to face some pressure. He gets the pass off, but it's incomplete. Out comes Mike Vanderjack. The 36-yard field goal is not pretty, but it's good. The team's offense is ground to a halt here. Indy backed up at the one-yard line in shotgun. Direct snap to Dominique Rhodes will pick up some yards, though. Thought that had a chance to be a walk-off safety for the Packers. Instead, this game heads to overtime, tied at 10 apiece. 
The Packers defense forces a three and out and sets up shop at their own 43 yard line. On third down, they're going to run Amon Green. He has not done much today outside of that fake punt run, but he's making up for it here, running it down to the 27 yard line. It's now second and 10. They're in field goal range. Amon Green will take another handoff, cut it inside, bounce outside, and he will outrun the defense. Touchdown in overtime. Green had three carries in this game for over five yards, and they were all massive. This one, the walk-off overtime touchdown. The Packers survive 16 to 10. No, that wasn't high scoring, but yes, that was super exciting. Defensive football can be awesome. This game was a prime example of that. The Packers will take over the Colts territory and any run we thought the Colts may have had has now come to an end. After several teases, the wheel is finally going to give us the New York Jets. They're going to head north. They had a chance to expand into Delaware. Instead, they got to go play Pittsburgh. At the two-minute warning, the Steelers are dominating 10-0. Cordell Stewart will drop back to pass. Nope, instead he's going to run it right into the end zone. That will push the Steelers out to a 17 to nothing lead. They used the ground and pound to beat the Jets in the submission. They scored on the final play of the game and picked up a two-point conversion to give us a final score of 27-8 Steelers. The Jets came, they saw, but they did not conquer. The Steelers take over their land and we're now down to our final seven teams. This is going to be an extremely close call on the wheel. It's just going to clip into the Bengals portion. And they have to head north and play the red-hot Green Bay Packers. Green Bay in total control of this one from the Bengal three-yard line, winning 14-3 in the second quarter. Amon Green will tap dance his way around the defense to get that touchdown and push the Packer lead up to 21-3. They didn't have a whole lot of problem putting this game away, allowing a late score to make it seem a little closer. 34-13 is the final. The Bengals had avoided getting on the field to this point, but once they did, they really didn't have much of a chance. The Packers will now take over their territory, and of the teams remaining, surprise, only the Patriots have yet to take the field. It's pretty amazing. We went 12 straight games without having a single expansion. That run ended. We got a couple here, but now we're getting this game. The New England Patriots are going to travel to the Pittsburgh Steelers. We talked about the Steelers wanting to make up for this season. They lost at home in the AFC title game to these Patriots, who then went on to win the Super Bowl. How will the imperialism rematch play out? The Patriots are moving the ball early. They have a third and four inside the 20 yard line. Tom Brady looks off the defender and throws it to Mark Edwards who keeps his feet in bounds for the touchdown. An impressive catch by the fullback there, giving the Patriots an early seven to nothing lead. The Steelers are trying to strike back here. We're in the second quarter. Lots of motion on both the offense and the defense. Cordell Stewart after the play action will fire it up to Plaxico Burris makes a diving catch. That will lead to a field goal at 7-3 now in the third quarter and Drew Bledsoe's in the game just like he was in the AFC title game. He will find Jermaine Wiggins up the middle. He will pick up a few yards, get it inside the 20-yard line. After losing some yardage, it's now third and 15. Time is ticking away in the third. Bledzo has time in the pocket, puts it up into the end zone for Troy Brown who comes down with it. That will give the Patriots now a two score lead, 14 to three. The Steelers have fourth and one in Patriot territory. They need this to stay in the game. Cordell Stewart will keep it around left end, gets a nice pickup here to about the 17 yard line. But he now leaves the game and Tommy Maddox is in his place. On the first play, Maddox will find Chris 
Fuamatu Maafala. He will do the rest for the touchdown. We could not fit his entire name onto this game, but we got the Fuamatu in there. 14-10. The Steelers kick it away on third and three. They need their defense to come up with a stop. Drew Bledsoe is going to go deep again to Troy Brown. Makes the catch. Gets it down to close to the 20-yard line. The Pats run out the clock, and they win this game 14-10. Redemption was not there for the Steelers. It seems as though in this era, the Patriots just had their number. New England will take over Pittsburgh's territory. That's their first win of this imperialism. But the reigning Super Bowl champions have joined the final five. The Packers lead the way this imperialism with four victories. They're looking to add to that total. They're heading to New Orleans to face the Saints. Packers lead 14-0 in the second quarter. They have the ball in their own territory. Amon Green bursts through the middle, avoids some tackles, and he's off to the races. The Saints look as though they're going to be able to catch him, and they do. That was for 64 yards, and the Packers follow it up with this touchdown pass to Bill Schrader. That will give them a 21 to nothing halftime lead. The Saints get an early field goal in the third quarter and are looking to get back in this. They're facing third and 10 from their own 16 yard line. Aaron Brooks will find Willie Jackson on the slant. What a great play, big game to get past the midfield. They're gonna be facing third down again, third and 13 this time. Brooks out of the shotgun. He's going to look for Joe Horn, and he is in the end zone with the Cats. The Packers giving up a couple of big third downs there. The Saints are making noise. It's 21-10. The Packers are going to look to quell that noise from the Saint 45-yard line. Favre looking downfield. Antonio Freeman might be this season's MVP in imperialism. He will get into the end zone for the touchdown. The Packers get back up to a 28 to 10 lead. The Saints do not want to go away though. From inside the Packer 10 yard line, Aaron Brooks is gonna find Deuce McAllister. He's gonna run it in for the touchdown. It's now 28, 17. There's just under four minutes to go in this game. What might the Saints do here? They are gonna kick it onside. The Packers don't look ready for it and the Saints recover. They've driven it down to the 23. It's third down. Third and very short this time. But they convert it again with a pass to Joe Horn. The drive stays alive. It is once again third down. Third and goal from the seven-yard line. The Saints are going to run it to Ricky Williams, but the Packers stop them. Now what can they do on fourth down? 2.20 to go. The Saints are getting aggressive here. Play action to Ricky Williams, but Brooks will throw it to him anyway. The defense gets there too late, and the Saints have now scored 14 unanswered. It's 28 to 24. With 2.10 left in the game, this time the Saints are gonna kick it away. Donald Driver back to receive, gets it inside his 10 yard line, doesn't get much on it though. It is third and one. This is the down that has defined this game. Amon Green may not have it. The sticks are out. He's short, so the Saints will get it back. One minute to go from their own 27. Aaron Brooks throws deep to Joe Horn. He'll make the catch, escape the defender, gets away from someone else, runs it down inside the 15-yard line. This task just got much easier. 40 seconds to go. They're going to run Ricky Williams around the right side. He's going to get about four yards here. 24 seconds to go. Second down. All sorts of movement on both sides of the ball. Williams gets it again around right end. He uses the speed and will score. And the Saints have unbelievably scored the final 21 points of this game in the fourth quarter. The Superdome has gone nuts. What a come from behind victory. New Orleans will beat Green Bay 31 to 28. We put so much stock in the Colts being the team that might be sub 500 to win imperialism. The Saints, 7-9 in 2001, have a chance to do it now as well. 
It's a big upset. They will take over the Packers' territory, and we've reached the final four. It's been a little while, but we're welcoming the Tampa Bay Buccaneers back to the game. And since they're still down there alone in South Florida, there's only one place for them to go. The Superdome will host its second consecutive game. The Bucs will play at the Saints. This game was tied at 7 entering the second quarter, but it's now 16-7 Tampa. Brad Johnson is going to dump this off to Warwick Dunn. He's going to run it in the rest of the way. Touchdown Tampa. That'll make it 23-7. They'll add a field goal before the half ends. There will be no comeback for the Saints in this one. They tried, but Tampa's defense is too good. 36-20 is our final score. With that victory, Tampa Bay will expand greatly into the rest of the map. They will take over the Saints' territory, and we have three teams remaining, none of which have won more than two games. Tampa will have to be in the next game, though, as the 49ers and Patriots cannot reach each other. Who will they be playing against? The wheel spin is going to be landing on the Patriots. They're not going to expand. They're heading west to face the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. That will put the 49ers in their record ninth imperialism title game. Will they play the Patriots for a third time in that game, or will it be the Bucs for the first time? Tampa Bay hosts New England. The winner goes to the dance. 7-7 seven, seven ball game in the second quarter, 228 to go. Patriots in the red zone. This pass goes up to Troy Brown, and he really does do it all for this Patriots team. That will put them up 14-7. Now Tampa races down the field very quickly and set up shop at the 41. This pitch goes to Warwick Dunn around right side. He's picking up a lot of tremendous blocks, uses his speed to get past that last tackle attempt, and just like that, the Bucks have tied this game up at 14 apiece. We're going into halftime with that score. The Patriots take a field goal. It's now 17-14. The Bucks have taken it to the 21. Brad Johnson is going to look downfield for Mike Allstar making the play. Touchdown catch for him. That will make this a 21 to 17 game. The Patriots have it now in the fourth quarter. It's third and goal, but all the way back at their own 24. All sorts of changes at the line for both teams. Tom Brady will drop back to pass. Jamie Duncan takes him down, strips him of the ball, and the Bucks are going to pick it up and give it a good run back past the 40, down to almost the 30. That will result in another touchdown catch by Mike Allstott. The Buccaneers now lead 27 to 17. The extra point gets blocked, but they don't care. 27-17 is going to serve as this game's final score. And that will take the Buccaneers into their second consecutive Imperialism Championship game. They came up short last time. They're going to look to make amends for that. On the other side, the 49ers have actually now tied the Minnesota Vikings with 60 overall wins. They're also tied with the Vikings for four Imperialism Championships. With a win here, they break both of those ties. Let's find out where this game's going to be played. We spin this wheel and it's going to land on the Buccaneers. They're going to have to travel to San Francisco. Interesting note, the Niners have played four Midwestern teams and four Eastern teams in the Imperialism title game. They're 0-4 against the Midwest, but 4-0 against the East. They're also 3-1 at home. The Bucks have the deck stacked against them. Can they overcome? The Imperialism title game of 2001 begins. The Niners strike first with a field goal, but Tampa's on the move. Second and goal back at the 13. Brad Johnson finds Dave Moore, who gets away from his defender and scores. First touchdown of the game for either team, 7-3 Tampa. The Niners are going to get a safety to make this 7-5, and now they've driven it down 2-5. Tampa backs up the defense. The Niners respond with Garrison Hurst up the middle, and he gets in for the score. The Niners are going to retake the lead here at 12-7. We remain in the second quarter, and Tampa has moved the ball to the 49er 36. 
Brad Johnson will drop back the pass. Looking for Keyshawn Johnson. Great pass. Keyshawn takes it down to the five-yard line. That's going to lead to Mike Allstart's third touchdown reception in the last two games. Tampa hits the extra point. They're going to lead 14-12 at halftime. They have the ball just inside midfield in the third. Johnson drops back. Again, he's going to look for Keyshawn. These are the only two catches he's made in this game, but they've both been huge. He's down at the one-yard line. Tampa fails to score on first and second down. Here they come on third down. The Niners will stop Allstott. They know a little something about goal line stands in championship games. Tampa doesn't want to mess around anymore. They're going to bring out Martin Gramatica for the extremely short field goal. He is going to put it through. The lead goes to 17-12. The Niners now have it. They're back at their own 23. It's second down. Garcia is under pressure. Warren Sapp, his first play of the game, making the sack, getting the ball back for his team after a failed third down conversion by the Niners. Tampa from the 20-yard line. This pass goes to work. Dunn makes a great catch. This time, they're going to be able to get Allstott into the end zone. That will make this a two-score game. It's 24 to 12. We're sitting here in the fourth quarter, and the 49ers are in desperation mode. They're backed up at their own 33-yard line. Jeff Garcia has plenty of time. Lofts a deep pass to Terrell Owens, splitting the two defenders. The ball is placed perfectly, and Owens is able to get his way into the end zone. An incredible 67-yard touchdown. This game is back on. The Niners actually go for two here, and Garrison Hurst is going to score it. So it's 24-20. Tampa now has it. 301 left in the game. They're going to run it to Mike Allstott, trying to grind some clock. But he has other ideas, cuts inside, and is able to go into the Niner 34-yard line. Next play, 2.37 to go now. The Niners crowd the line, anticipating run. Allstott does get it, but he's able to get around and pick up another big chunk of yards. This puts him over 100 yards rushing on the game. They stop him on first and second down. And on third down, Brad Johnson's going to look downfield. Dave Moore is there. He makes the touchdown reception his second of the game. The Bucks get back out to a 31-20 lead. They clamp down the rest of the way. 31-20, final score, Tampa wins. And with that win, we can say for the first time that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are your imperialism champion the pirate flag sits on top of the entire united states of america this super bowl matchup featured a champion who wasn't ranked in our top five and a runner-up who rated out as the season's number one team yet neither could get into the championship game in imperialism instead we got the tampa bay buccaneers who have been very good now for a few years and the San Francisco 49ers enjoying a mini resurgence after a couple of bad seasons. Tampa finally got over the hump after losing the title game in our 2000 season. And by getting over the hump, they did what their real-life counterparts did not do, which ultimately cost head coach Tony Dungy his job. And they certainly had the talent to be champions. A balanced offense with a very good offensive line that included a Hall of Famer in Randall McDaniel. Fullback Mike Allstott stood out and proved invaluable in both the title game and the game that preceded it. But these Buccaneers are known for their oppressive defense. Warren Sapp, Derek Brooks, Rondé Barber, and John Lynch are all Hall of Famers and many would advocate for Simeon Rice as well which would mean that just about half the starters on this defense would be Hall of Famers, which is pretty damned insane. We had a lot of great action in the first half of games, even if they weren't all particularly close. Standing out among the crowd was that excellent Colts-Bears game. In the second half of games, we had that ridiculous Saints-Packers game with the Saints making that epic comeback. The Patriots giving the Bucks a game before folding, and the Bucks taking the crown in a highly competitive game against the 49ers. 
The Bucks won nine times last season before losing in the title game. Perhaps playing less helped them along the line in this one, as they only needed four wins to take it all. The Packers joined them as the only other team with more than two victories. Wins overall, however, were well spread out, with 18 different teams claiming at least one. We have a new team at the top of the overall standings. Well, kinda. The 49ers and Vikings both hit the 60 win mark and are in a flat-footed tie at 60 and 32. The 49ers sit above the Vikings solely based on alphabetical order. The Chiefs revert back to a losing record, with several other teams now threatening to do the same. And the Seahawks can no longer use their late entry into the league as an excuse. They have the lowest overall win percentage. Thank you so much for joining us for 2001 Imperialism. I hope you enjoyed it. Please give it a like, some shares, and if you haven't yet, subscribe to the channel. In the season before winning the Super Bowl, the Buccaneers have covered the United States as imperialism champion. They'll look to repeat in 2002 when we finally arrive at the 32-team NFL that we know today. I hope you join us for that journey. Until next time, thank you again for watching, and I hope you have an awesome day.